Okay, good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, I would like to start my talk by, of course, uh, thanking the organizer for uh, allowing me to present this work here. Uh, it's really a pleasure for me to be here, especially a pleasure because a long time ago, like 20 years ago, I did a postdoc here in, in, in Philadelphia, discovering the amazing fly in Bob Fickelstein's lab, a couple of blocks away from here. So it's very nice to be here. It's very nice to meet people that I haven't seen for 20 years, two years, which is percent of a human experience. Okay, so what I would like to talk to you about today is the impact that bacteria can have on the behavior uh, and the physiology of the flies. So work by many labs, including ours, have been over, over the years dissecting the molecules which are produced by the bacteria and how they are sensed by the flies to trigger an immune response. What I would like to convince you today that the same molecule and the same pathway are also used actually to change the behavior and the physiology of the flies. So let me just first to introduce you the, the topic. So the mechanism by which a uh, eukaryote uh, host has to recognize uh, microorganisms. So this, uh, in this case, we are dealing with bacteria. So the bacteria has many compounds, such as flagellin, DNA, peptoglycan, lipopolysaccharides, which are called microbe-associated molecule patterns. And these patterns are recognized by the host by pattern recognition receptors. So if you are a mice, you, can, you are able to detect a lot of different molecules, like, uh, as I just mentioned, flagellin, RNA, LTA. But what we learned from genetic screen for the community is that actually if you are flies, you see much less uh, maps. Flies, basically, the way that flies see a bacteria is really by recognizing peptoglycan, which is a cell wall component of the flies. How does the fly, a fly does that? So let me just introduce you the, the peptoglycan. So peptoglycan is a long chain. I only show uh, one motif here, but it's a long chain of disaccharide linked by peptide bridges. And that how the fly recognizes these peptide bridges? By this family of protein called peptoglycan recognition proteins, called PGRPs. And as you can see, there is a re direct recognition between the uh, peptoglycan and the PGRP molecule. So this is at the molecular level. Now at the cellular level, level what's happened? So today we will only talk about extracellular bacteria. They will not enter the cell, and they will even not enter the body, you will see later. So what happened when the bacteria uh, uh, arrived? Eventually it proliferates. It's released peptoglycan. And this peptoglycan is able to be sensed by this membrane-associated receptor called PGRP-LC in this case. This is going to, to induce the production of antimicrobial peptide through the nf kappa pathway, which is shown here. And this antimicrobial peptide will eventually kill the flies. And this is shown in this, in this picture here, what you have like a, a wild-type fly, which has been infected with bacteria. And this is a reporter trend gene for the antimicrobial peptide production. And you can see there is uh, some red uh, mark in, in some of the tissue of the flies. Important for the talk here, it has been shown, and we'll see later, that the nf kappa pathway, it's too strong activation of the nf kappa pathway, is detrimental for the flies. Okay? So the, this IMT pathway, nf kappa pathway, that I show here, is under a very strong negative regulations. And one of the regulators which I'd like to talk about today is this PGRP again. This is another member of the same family of proteins. But this one doesn't look like, does not act as a receptor. It's like an enzyme which cleaves the peptoglycan. By doing that, it reduces the intensity of the nf kappa pathway activation. This is shown here. If you take a mutant, which is like lost this PGRP amidase, which is called, you can see there is more peptoglycan stronger nf kappa pathway activation, and that more antimicrobial peptide. And I think this is clearly shown here. This mutant PGRP LB mutant here, we infect the same condition of the wild tap, and you can see you have a much stronger immune response. We have recently shown, actually, that, and with other labs, that interestingly, depending on the cell type of the, uh, of the flies, you can, only have, you can have not only have a detection at the membrane of the cells, but also inside the cell, in some, some of the cells are able to detect the peptoglycan inside the cells. So the extracellular peptoglycan which the inside of the cell, is recognized by another member of the same family, and is triggered NF-kappa B pathway activation. 
And also interesting, important for later in the talk, we have shown that there is also cytosolic amides which cleave the spectroglycan inside the cell. Okay. And this will be important later because, uh, later because then we'll use that to sort of erase the peptoglycan from the cell. So basically, what I just told you here, that there is one ligand, peptoglycan, which can be recognized at the membrane in some cells, inside the cell, in other cells. In both cases, this activates the nf pathway, pathway. And this can be buffered by enzymes, either extracellularly or intracellularly. So now let's look at the uh, settings that we're going to use. Uh, we are going, oh, this is at the cellular level, what happened now at the organism level? So this is a fly here. We are going to use one bacteria called Herbinia carotoroba. This is a gram-negative bacteria. And we are again mainly going to use uh, oral infection, although this will not be always the case. So when the fly is feeding uh, on this bacteria, this bacteria is inside the gut. It's eventually released the speptoglycan. This peptoglycan, in some case, can enter some enterocytes, okay, and this will trigger antimicrobial peptide production. Okay. Important, very important for the talk here, by mechanism that we don't understand, the peptoglycan is able to leave the gut lumen here and to reach the hemolymph of the flies. And in this case, it acts on the fat body to activate the systemic immune response. And actually, the purpose of my talk here is to try to tell you that, okay, this peptoglycan, which comes from the gut microbiota, is able to reach the hemolymph here, activate the immune response. But of course, there is other tissue and organ is this hemolymph. So what are the consequences of this peptoglycan on these tissues? Okay. Such as the brain or the ovary, we'll see. And so what are the consequences of having peptoglycan inside the body cavity? And so the reason also I'll tell you that, because we have been infecting flies for many years in the lab now, and we have been always amazed to realize how much and how quickly when you infect flies with bacteria, you change their behavior. So we make hypothesis that maybe this peptoglycan, which is inside the hemolymph, can modify the behavior of the flies. So to test this hypothesis, we just focus on one very well-characterized uh, behavior of the fly, which is egg-laying behavior. So what you will see here, you can see the fly, wild-type fly, which has been just prickled with a clean needle, and you can see the number of eggs laid by the female. The same female, wild-type fly, which has been infected with bacteria, in this case we are not going feeding the bacteria in the, in the gut, but we are pricking directly the bacteria, but we get the same result with feeding, and this is just simpler for uh, experimental uh, reason. So if we infect this bacteria, this is fly with bacteria now, you can see you have less eggs laid by the eggs, by the female. If you do the same experiments in the PGRP LP minus, which means the amides uh, background, when you have more petoglycan, you can see that the phenotype is exacerbated. So to quantify that, we are going to use the OV position index, which is the number of eggs laid by the female, which has been just infected by, uh, not infected by pre, by a sterile needle versus the number of eggs laid by a uh, needle with bacteria. So in this case, for example, in wild type uh, female, in black, you can see that after six hours, you have a 0.5 OV position index saying that half the infection reduced by two the number of eggs laid by the female. You can see this is a transient effect because that, since at 24 hours, you go back to wild type level. And you can see also that this is exacerbated in the PGRPLB minus background. For this result, it suggests actually that peptoglycan might affect the behavior of the flies. But we have injected all bacteria here. So let's see what happens if we inject only highly purified peptoglycan. And you can see in this case, there is only peptoglycan, there is no bacteria involved here. And you can inject peptoglycan, you can totally mimic the phenotype that you get with bacteria. So this suggests that presence of the peptoglycan inside the body cavity is sufficient to change the behavior of the flies. The obvious question is whether this is going through the same signaling pathway as the one for the immune response, the NF-KPV pathway. So for that, we just decided to do the injection in two different mutant backgrounds. So this is one type control here, nice drop post-infection. If you remove NF-KPV, you have no longer the drop. 
if you remove the membrane associated receptor, you still have the drop. If you remove the intracellular receptor, you, have, you no longer have the drop. Okay. So this tells you that somewhere in the fly, petalocan sensing intracellularly in some cells is triggering a haggling drop. Okay. So we were sort of excited by these results, actually, but the goal now was to find the, the cell which were uh, responding to this petalocan. And uh, so uh, one very sort of obvious uh, solution, although this is not what we test to start with, actually, but one of the obvious solution is that since haggling is a behavior which can not only control, is it possible that nf kappa u pathway activation in neurons is regulating the haggling behavior? For that, we did sort of a pretty simple experiment. You use a pan urinal cal for driver, he have to, with RNAi, inactivate the nf kappa b pathway in all the neurons of the flies, but no, nowhere else, not in the immune tissue. And if you do that, you can see that you can completely suppress the haggling posing post-infection. Okay. So this tells you that nf kappa b activation in neurons, in response to petroglycans, reduce haggling behavior. Now the obvious question is why, which neurons? And we, we didn't really have any ideas. But pretty strangely, although this uh, immune pathway has allowed uh, Jules Hoffman to get a Nobel Prize actually for that, it, 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 we have absolutely no idea where are these, all these immune genes expressed in all this, which tissue actually. So we saw that maybe if we try to figure out in which tissue different genes are expressed, maybe we can have any hints on what are the neurons which are implicated. So for that we decided to make we put a construct for the two enzymes which I mentioned before, this uh, cytosolic and this cytosolic and this secreted enzyme. They are two isoforms from the same gene, actually. And we clone just two KB upstream of these two isoforms to make GAL4 lines. And if you do that, and we cross the two different GAL4 lines with US RFP, as expected, you can see that you see stunning in some of the immune tissue, such as the fat body or uh, the pericardi pericardial cells, visceral muscles. This was expected. These are immune genes that were expected to be expressed in immune tissues. But more surprising to us, actually, it turned out that one out of the two constructs okay, was not only driving expression in immune tissues, but also in the normal system. So you have here a presentation of a schematic representation of, of a normal system with the brain connected to the VNC, which infinite connects, in this case, at the ovary to regulate haggling behavior. So I think it's pretty clear that using either a nuclear GFP or a membrane associated with GFP, you can see that these lines is driving expression in some of the neurons of the flies. So this, this GAL4 lines, which I'm using, which is called PLB1, we decided to characterize this line a bit further. First, we decided to see is if are we inactivating nf kappa b pathway not in all the cells, but only in these cells now, are we going to recapitulate the phenotypes? And indeed, this is the case here. When you, through RNAi, when you inactivate the nf kappa b pathway in the PLB1 cells, you completely suppressed, completely suppressed the egg-link drops. To make sure this was really a normally controlled uh, uh, behavior, we just play around with this line with a trip A channel in which you can modulate the activity of neurons. In this case, this is in the absence of infection, but this is a temperature sensitive gene. So depending on the temperature, you can or not activate the neurons. And you can see, in contrast to control here, activating the trip channel in PLB1 cells was sufficient to modify egg-link behavior. All this data lets us conclude that probably LB1 positive cells contain some neurons which respond to petroglycan. So which neuron are we talking about here? So for that, we went back to see the fly and to try to understand why the fly were not laying egg post-infection. What was the problem? So how flies are laying eggs? This is from the ovary, obviously, and this is made of different ovules, and then you have the stem cell here, and then progressive differentiation of fully mature oocyte, which eventually will be delivered by the female. So we decided just to count what was happening in that, and if you do that, you can compare the ovaries of uninfected versus affected flies, what, and you different stage of our genesis here, you can see that infection is here, induce an increase 
of late stage oocytes, but a decrease of early stages. And I think this is pretty clearly visible here. You have non-infected ovary in which you have immature and mature oocytes. But in infected ovaries, almost all of the uh, uh, oocytes are mature oocytes. So it's clear that since we have a block ovulation, and, but a continuous differentiation of the oocytes. And we saw that there was no sign of apoptosis in this case. So this was interesting. This was interesting because there was a couple of reports actually implicating the bioamine octopamine in the ovulation of the flies. So we said maybe this can be one of the molecules which is implicated in our uh, agglin proteins. So octopamine is produced from tyrosine through the successive action of two enzymes, TDC2 and TBTH, which produce octopamine. And if you are mutant for octopamine, female, what happens is you don't lay eggs, which means that you have a sort of big belly here due to the accumulation of, ovary, of late oocytes in the, in the ovaries. And this is exactly the phenotype we saw when we inactivate our PLB1 cells with tetanus toxin. To further demonstrate that actually octopaminic was implicated, we decided to inactivate the nf B pathway in RNRI using the octopaminergic specific drivers. And if you do that, you can see that, again, you completely block egg-laying posing post-infections. So this, I think, tell you clearly that in one hand, we have PLB1 cells, which contains the cell which regulate egg-laying behavior, and then we have octopamine cells, which also regulate egg-laying behavior through nf B. So can we actually find in what are in-betweens? For that, we did the classical intersection experiments that we do in, in, in North, North biology, because there was around 100 200 octopaminic cells in neurons in the flag uh, CNS, so we decided to try to see whether we can map them, actually. And if you can see here, these are sort of ongoing experiments, so we are not totally uh, at, the, at, the, at the hand, but what you can see in the brain, eh, in the VNC, that in red, you have uh, uh, cells which are labeled with uh, anti TDC2, which are octopaminergic neurons, yeah? And you can see that in the brains, we only identify one to two cells which were simultaneously positive for octopamine and for PLB1. Okay. And together in the VNC also, we saw very little amount of cells which are positive for both of them. So I think we think that there were very little neurons which are both LB1 positive and octopaminergic positive. But the functional, uh, the final demonstration that this is indeed this cell which are important is the in functional intersection between these two pathways. And when we inactivate the nf B pathway with SERNI with at the intersection between PLP1 and octopaminergic neuron, which means either in a few cells here or in these cells here, this is sufficient to block egg behavior. So this is what this project at, at, at that time is now. So what we believe that infection of the, uh, of the flies produce peptoglycan, and that this peptoglycan is sensed by a very few number of, the, of octopaminergic neurons, and that they will in turn affect uh, egg-laying behavior. I'd like just like to, to finish now to tell you a little bit uh, another story, but shorter. So what I show you now so far are the consequences of an acute infection of the flies. What I would like to talk to you about now is the consequence of a chronic infection of the flies. Okay. So what are we going to do? No, we are going to take flies now, feed these flies here, and conti continuously infect the fly over the, uh, over the times. And if you do that, if you do non-infected fly, they live pretty well. After a while, wild-type fly, this is a gray bar here, finish, eventually die. But strangely, and related to what I told you before, if you are a mutant for nf B pathway, you long, live longer. If you are mutant for PGRPLB, when you have too strong immune response, you live shorter. And if you have a double mutant between PGRPLB and nf B, you are partially rescued, showing the detrimental effect of nf B constant activation for the flies. So we decided to, to test what was the consequence for that, what was the reason for that. One of the things we test, we take geotexis assay, in which you Take the fly, you bang the tube at, at the, uh, on the fly, and you measure the number of flies which reach uh, the top of the fly. This is the mean to test the normal muscular activity of the flies. 
if you do that in wild type flies, so light bars are not infected flies, dark bars are infected flies. You can see, oh, you can see that, no, you can see actually that infection decreases geotaxis performance of the flies. This is fully nf kappa -B pathway dependent. If you are nf kappa -B mutant here, there is no difference between fly infected and non-infected flies. Again, this is highly exacerbated in the PGRP-LB minus background and gone in the double mutant background. Okay. So constant activation of the nf kappa -B pathway reduce the performance of the flies. So we try to see what was going on, what was the reason for that, and we try to look at the organs of the flies. First, we look at the brain. If you look at the brains, chronic infection of flies begin to uh, show some signs of no degeneration with vacuoles being there. Okay. If you look now in the internal organs of the fly, you see a very strong organ wasting. Okay. These are wild type flies with ovary and a beautifully white fat body. After a while, infected flies, there is a very strong organ wasting with almost no ovary left and no more or very degenerate fat bodies. Again, these phenotypes are exacerbated in PGRP LB minus background here and completely rescue in the double mutant background between PGRP and nf kappa -B. So this tells you that constant activation of the nf kappa -B pathway in the flies leads to some uh, organ wasting and no oxygenation. So the of course question from that is it maybe the peptoglycan which come from the gut now go from the fat body, okay, but also go to other organs and affect these organs. And one of them will be eventually the brain. So for that we test this, this hypothesis by just feeding fly with bacteria, isolating the brain and see what happens. If you do that you can see that you measure antimicrobial peptide production through QRT-PCR, you can see that different antimicrobial peptides are produced by the brain in a fully nf kappa -B dependent manner. Just to make sure this is a direct effect of the peptoglycan, if you isolate the brain and you put the peptoglycan on top of it, you get exactly the same results. Okay. So this tells you that the brain responds to the GERD-derived peptoglycan. As you know, the brain is made of these two big types of cells, neurons and glial cells. So we wonder whether one of them was responding rather than the other. And for that, we decided to use nf kappa -B RNA i against with specific drivers. And you can see, if you use no null driver, you don't affect at all the activation of the nf kappa -B pathway in the brain. But if you lose glial drivers, then you see a marked reduction. This suggests that, indeed, glial cells are responding to gut derived peptoglycan. People in the community have isolated at least five different types of glial cells, two of them here, forming the blood brain barrier, the perineal and the subperineal cell. Okay. Using specific driver for these different types of perineal, uh, the glial cells, we were able to show that only one of them actually responds to get the right peptoglycan, which is the perineal one, which is the more outermost cells of the blood brain barrier. And this is uh, confirmed here, if this is brain stained with a perineal GF marker here, and an antimicrobial peptide here. This is an uninfected brain. You can see few staining here. Now if we infect the fly by a gut infection, we get a much stronger activation of the antimicrobial peptide in the most uh, perineal cells of, 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 the, of the flies. So this tells you that actually the peptoglycan can reach the hemolaf, talk to the CNS, and but we saw in the, in the same time the problem in the ovaries and in the fat bodies. But we know from previous results that constant activation of uh, nf kappa -B pathway in the fat body does not lead to fat body de degeneration. Suggestion actually that the effect we saw here and here might be indirect effect, non-tissue autonomous effect. So we decided to test that. One way we tested that is actually just to activate the nf kappa -B pathway only in perineal glial cells in the absence of infection. And if you do that, if you measure the geotaxis assay here, you use GUT, GAL4 driver, to activate the nf kappa -B. This does not change at all the geotaxis. Fat body driver does not do anything. 
but we take perineal gal for driver to strongly reduce the geotaxis activity. Even more strikingly for me, because this is not equal to grain, if you look, for example, now at the ovaries, okay, if you activate the nf B pathway only in the brain blood barrier, you can see a very strong reduction of, uh, of the ovaries, organ wasting. So this is kind of function experiments. We prefer to do loss of function, and like come back to this enzy enzyme which I mentioned before, which is this enzyme which is able to cleave the peptoglycan to erase the peptoglycan inside the cells. Okay. So we say now, if we are able to erase uh -oh, the peptoglycan only on glial cells, are we going to be able to prevent the wasting phenotype that we see after feeding? Okay. And it is, this is indeed the case. You have here a PGRP LB minus background, which has been infected, chronically infected, fat body degeneration, organ wasting in the ovaries. If now you just erase, if you want, the petroglycan only inside the glial cells, nowhere else, you can fully rescue the phenotypes here. So we don't yet understand how it works, but there is this indicates that clearly there was a dialogue between the microbiota, the blood brain barrier, which affect peripheral tissues. Okay, so from that I would like to, uh, to, to finish my talk to give you the model. So what I've shown you that this bacteria is able to have a microbiota. This microbiota produce peptoglycan, which is produced by every single bacteria species. This bacteria peptoglycan can eventually enter the enterocytes, produce antimicrobial peptide, and this will in turn control the microbiota. But this peptoglycan can also reach the hemolymph and then talk with the fat body to trigger the systemic immune response in case the bacteria is inside the hemolymph to kill the bacteria. What, what I, I think what we've shown recently is that the same peptoglycan, the same motif produced by bacteria, can be sensed intracellularly by some neurons, octopaminergic neurons. And then this is going to affect oviposition. As I told you, I think we, we believe there is very few octopaminergic positive neurons which are also expressed the immune regulator, so it means that there is probably other behavior which are controlled by the bacteria that we don't know yet. Well, I'll show you also that the same peptoglycan upon chronic infection, which is a different condition, can eventually talk to the perineal cell brain brain barrier, and that infinite will affect other tissues such as the fat body of the ovaries. And I think what is also in, uh, interesting is that this whole process is controlled, buffered, by petroglycan cleaving enzymes. The ones which I mentioned which are secreted, which are act in the gut lumen to prevent actually this petroglycan to reach the hemolymph. And then cell autonomously in other tissues such as the neuron here and the enterocyte. So from that, I'd like to, to thank the people which have done the work, mainly a, a good, big thanks to Bernard Charou, which has been a long-term collaborator and been involved in many projects here. The work on oviposition has been done with Bernard together with Leo, and now is uh, continuing by, by Ambra, PhD student. And the work on the dialogue between the brain brain buyer and microbiota has been done between uh, Olivier and Raphael, and we'd like to thank also Sabine and uh, and Lisa Luchardia. And thank you very much for your attention.